Uh, John Stumpen, let me uh, like, give you a chance just to introduce yourself a little bit, maybe uh, you're, when you graduated, and give us like a one-minute career summary of uh, where you were to where you are now. All right. Uh, thanks. Well, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm John. I, I graduated from Norman in 2009. And for my pathing, it's going to be a little bit different than probably everyone else's. Uh, I didn't go the traditional four-year college route. I did one year in college, and then I went directly into the workforce. I started working with Best Buy and did some, some Geek Squad to get my toes dipped into the IT world, and then was able to get, you know, put my foot in the door with a corporate job and start working my way up the ladder from support to an engineering consulting career path. And I moved into software engineering and did that for about four years. And after that, I kind of started to fall in love with dealing with what you're going to hear a lot today is DevOps and DevOps engineering. And after that, I found that to be my calling, left my previous company, and I'm, I'm with a new company now and working purely in a DevOps engineer role and absolutely loving it where I'm currently at. Excellent. Hey, let me, let me let, real quick now, now you said uh, when you worked for your other company, you transferred into software engineering. Mm -hmm. um, now, now I, that is potentially something kids could major in, right? In college, you, you, you learn more about it on the ground. Uh, do you want to explain real quick what, what it means to be a software engineer? Yeah, so traditionally, most people will be familiar with a computer science degree as being the kind of staple for breaking into the IT world. A lot of colleges are starting to split that off into a little bit more of a specialization for software engineering. And that's going to focus more on the principles and architecture of how to build software, how to design software to be efficient, and focus a little bit more on the different languages uh, that you may come across when designing software. You know, you're, you're, you're effectively self-taught. You're on the job. Um, you know, you, you started in a, uh, a field that gave you a little bit of responsibility. You did your job super well. You learned more as you were doing it. Um, you entered the corporate world, um, the company that hired you for your technology skills. You, you developed your skill set a lot. It was, uh, and in fact, if anybody's interested, I could probably throw a link in the video. Uh, John sat with us for an interview a, a year or two ago uh, with his other company about some of the work he did there. And again, they, they spoke extraordinarily highly <laughs> your ability. You were really their go-to guy for lots of stuff there. And uh, so then the idea is as you continue to grow and develop your skill set, you found sort of a niche that you were sort of really passionate about and that you, uh, you found another company to sort of scratch that itch a little bit better. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that you didn't enjoy your other work, but you, you, you wanted to pursue this in, in more detail too. Uh, yep. And again, and that's, and that's a really good point that we should make to the, to the kids watching is that, you know, especially in technology fields, you know, what you're doing now may not be what you're doing in, in four or five years because uh, fields change, uh, needs change, and agile people sort of look ahead and see what's going to be needed and sort of hop into new fields and, and sort of get into the, uh, get in on the ground floor. And, and uh, so you're, you're in the field of DevOps and you probably can't find a lot of colleges that have like a DevOps major right now. This is sort of a, a new emerging field. Um, so, so why don't you tell us a little bit about DevOps um, to start, the, the two words that make it up are development and operations. Uh, right. So if you could tell us a little bit about just a real quick summary of each of those and sort of how DevOps blends them together. So traditionally in software development as a whole, you have your development team and, and this team is going to build the actual software, the product. They're going to write the code. They're going to design it from the ground up. Your operation team lives on the, and, and we'll kind of create a wall here. Your operation team lives on the other side of the wall. They're the ones that are going to be managing the product once it releases to the public. So, you know, if you're familiar with any of the programs out there, you know, we're using Zoom right now, but if you're familiar with Outlook or anything like that, they all have operations teams. They all need to manage and keep it up and running as close to 24 7, 365 as they can. So where a DevOps team fits in is we kind of bridge the gap between the two teams. We work on making sure that the development team can focus on coding the application 
and we let the operations team manage the operations. We we fill the gap, we bridge it between the, the two teams. We make sure the, the code gets built properly. So we're making sure all of our scans and all of the tests are running. And then we also help design the infrastructure, that being the servers, the, the hard drives that store all the data. We, we build all of that and then we deploy it. And, and, and so when you're talking about the production ends of things, um, it, the implication is that the production continues. Like yes. when, when you roll out Outlook or Facebook or Zoom, there are still people who are, who are working on the program itself um, and continue to add new features. And then there's the operation side that makes sure, you know, when those things are deployed, that it doesn't like, you know, that everything's still working, that the consumer experience is still what the expectations would be for that and things like that. Yes. And then, um, so what, what, what changed in the technology world that made your job like an important one to exist that it didn't exist like 10 years ago? Uh, really the the cloud is the the biggest technology change that kind of i would say allowed devops engineering to really grow in in the field uh, being that no longer developers were just running uh the builds as you uh, would call it on their local machines now we're using external software and that could be you know if you get into computer science, you'll hear GitHub being one of the largest source code repositories currently available, owned by Microsoft. You'll hear some others. There's GitLab, um, Azure DevOps, which is another product owned by Microsoft, but that kind of hosts your code in a data center. And then when you go to build it, it's using their proprietary software to build your code. The problem is, is the developers shouldn't need to worry about that. So that's where DevOps comes in. We, we build the system, we make sure that the code is building. And if it wasn't for the cloud, I, I don't know that DevOps would really even exist because there's just so much complexity there that developers would be bogged down for hours. They, they wouldn't be able to write the code anymore. So in that context, it sounds like your job involves a lot of communication. It does. Uh, I personally, right now, uh, I'm involved with four different teams um, at my current company. So there are four different meetings I have to attend every day with different teams and give them status updates. And I might be getting status updates from them or requests. If one of the builds fails or one of our build systems go down, we're talking about hours upon hours of delays for development teams. And then it just starts stacking up from there. And if they can't produce the product, we're essentially losing money. I mean, I think some people think they want to go into computers because they don't want to deal with other people. But you're saying, like, you, your job is all about dealing with other people. It's 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 a high tech yeah. job that requires a lot of communication in order to you know fluidly produce the product you guys are doing. Any more, I I think, with the way the software has gotten so complex, being able to say I will not deal with people is incredibly difficult. Um, it, it, it's become very much a, a team atmosphere, unless, unless you're going to be a Mark Zuckerberg or, um, you know, one of those visionary types who absolutely just understands everything about coding and can write an entire program beginning to end by yourself that will sell for a billion dollars. I think working by yourself alone, 24 seven is uh, almost unreasonable. I mean, you'll still get five, six hours a day working alone. You, you may not have to have meetings or anything like that, but meetings and, and working with your team and communicating has become such a big part because no one person can have all the knowledge in their head. It has to be spread across the team and you have to rely on your team members to help you out with it. All right. Well, let's say, well, I think technically we're a little over time right now, but real quick, yeah. uh, let, let's yeah. end with a, uh, do you have a fun little antidote in terms of like where like a communication communication issue just resulted in like a major problem that you had to like untangle for your company? So my, my company is relatively young. So there, there are a lot of growing pains with that. <laughs> and one of them is we're not a hundred percent sure of all of our, uh, we, 
when you, when you write code, you use a lot of third-party packages to assist you with doing things that you don't want to write yourself. So we don't have a definitive list of everything that we use third-party wise. And unfortunately, um, two weeks out of the past three or four, there have been massive security vulnerabilities uh, in the web development community. Uh, malicious code getting deployed as packages, the whole nine yards. I basically had to spend like two entire days trying to track down these tiny little packages and make sure we're not compromised or our build servers don't have malicious code in them. And it's just one of those things. It doesn't seem funny, but you know, when you're in the thick of it, it it's kind of funny because it's like, man, if we just made one little list <laughs> of everything, I would have saved like 16 hours worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. I, 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 it looks like I am not paying attention to you right now. But I'm right now in. Um, I'm in Spotify, and I, I, I swear I was searching around on Spotify, and I think I found an area in Spotify where they're like, "Hey, here's all the, here's all the people that we use to help make this product." And it was just mm -hmm. a giant list of all these software programs, all these people providing other software that Spotify combines and 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 runs yep. together to create their to create their program. And they just rely on so many other people doing stuff to that feeds into their system. Um, so yeah, you're, you're dependent on tons of other people. Uh, yeah. In order to get your job done. So that's exciting and frustrating at the same time, I would imagine. It is. And, and what was really funny was both of these, these issues that came up, they're, uh, they're kind of core pillars in the development world. So some of the chats that I was involved with outside of my company, because I was, I was dealing with other engineers across the world with this. Um, you know, I was chatting with Facebook engineers, Google engineers, because we were all in the same boat. We're like, oh my God, this is horrible. What? <laughs> Our servers are going to blow up or something. <laughs> I mean, that's not like haha -ha funny, but in hindsight. Yeah. In hindsight, well, yeah. Hindsight's always funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's exciting. Uh, you know, where you started versus where you ended up. You know, the, the, the technology field offers tons of opportunities for people that are, uh, are agile. You know, you, you, you sort of decide what your passions are and, uh, you know, sort of aggressively pursue them. And I'm sure you wouldn't have imagined, you know, when you were, you know, downloading a, you know, an antiviral program into somebody's computer at Best Buy, that, you know, you'd be communicating with a global community of like Facebook and Google engineers trying to like no. crowdsource a solution <laughs> to, some, to some software problem. So... Yeah, that's super exciting. Hey, well, um, you know, on, on behalf of the district, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I, I appreciate all the uh, the awesome experiences that you're you're, you're getting. And um, you know, I guess if somebody wanted to do what you do real quickly, uh, since DevOps isn't really a major, uh, like in thirty seconds, what would be good choices for them? Honestly, just you know, if you're going to go to college, go for a typical computer science degree. Um, go on. Go on GitHub, go on Google, start looking up DevOps. If you know this is even remotely intriguing to you, start learning about the field. There are tons of resources out there, tons of practice tests and practice interviews so you can see what people are looking for and, and start playing around with the tools. And honestly, a lot of it's open source nowadays. You can freely download it onto your computer and play around with it. Okay, well, that's exciting. Hey. I appreciate your time, John, and uh, thanks for uh, contributing your uh, knowledge and expertise to Scaluda 2021. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.